Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, or whenever you happen to be listening to this, welcome to the Film Realist Podcast, the film and TV podcast from a complete nobody that is hopefully for somebody. My name is Kyle Naranya, and on episode 108, I will be reviewing Transformers 1, only the second animated Transformers film, but I am not alone. I am joined by Transformers aficionado, Ben Kendrick of comicbook.com. Dot com. Yeah, that's a new you're the first person who's gotten to say that on a podcast. I feel like I feel special. We we chatted before this, but I wanted to reference this because I don't know if you remember the last time you were on the podcast before we started the Denver Nuggets had the chance to win the NBA finals. Right. That's right. Yeah, I do remember that. I remember I was like, like, just, I was kind of like, oh, <laughs> that, that happened. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I, I didn't realize, I think at the time either, that you did a video podcast and I was like very disheveled looking. So this time I like, I still don't have my cool stuff behind me because like my office is next to Flynn's room and she's sleeping right now. But I have like a giant Prime One Studio Optimus Prime from the Bumblebee movie in that. Yeah, so you're, you're much more prepared. I should have brought my little like, I have my original little Optimus Prime toy that I had as a kid. I should have brought that down there, but. That's all right. I mean, the video is only for social media clips. I don't have the time. As everyone knows, this is a one person show in terms of the editing process. So they're <laughs> only ever for funny clips, yeah. which thankfully I figure out because I get the transcript and I go, what was that thing that people were saying? Mm -hmm. So as alluded to, we are going to be talking about Transformers 1. There will be a brief non-spoiler discussion as well as a full in-depth spoiler discussion. Time codes will be listed in the description, so there's no need to worry. Fortunately, Ben and I saw this early. It, as of right now, hasn't officially released. Longtime listeners of this show, the many different shows that you've been a part of, know that you like Transformers. Ew. So before we get into Transformers 1, I gave you a little bit of homework because mm -hmm. I don't know how, but it slipped my mind from yep. our last discussion. So I want you to rank the live action Transformers films. There's seven of them which yep. from worst to best. You don't have to tell us why. I mean, you can if you want to. Okay. But so starting at seven to number one. It's been an honor serving with you all. Autobots, roll out. We roll. Okay. So, yeah, I gave this a lot of thought and I tinkered with my list for a while. But worst Transformers movie. Revenge of the Fallen. Um, I mean, we know the production issues that were there, like, but that is like as purely Michael Bay as possible with racist robots and like robots turning into or people turning into like it was a lot of also aping from the Transformers movie plot line of killing Optimus and then resurrecting him and stuff. So, yeah, definitely the worst one. Um, I think. I think that actually could have been a cool movie if it wasn't for the writer strike and wasn't for the fact that they were making a lot of it up on the fly. Cause there's a lot of good ideas there, but it was, I mean, and there's a lot of very bad ideas, but so that's the worst one. Second worst movie. I included the animated movies. And so transformers, the movie is the second worst one, the animated film. And I'll tell you why I'll tell you why, because for all intents and purposes, it is a very good movie. It's classic. You know, they amazing voice actors. They sort of like rebooted the franchise within that movie. There's a lot of very cool things about it. And I acknowledge it's a great, like, animated film and very beloved. But them for killing. Oh, you don't cuss on this thing, do you? <laughs> Sorry, you're going to have to. That's okay. I've already pre. I have. I already decided this. And it, I'll give credit to Nalina. It's the Transformer sound is my bleep for this episode. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, so um, bleep them for killing Optimus Prime out the gate because they just wanted to sell different toys because that is 100% the reason they did it. And I understand that's why Megatron became Galvatron. Like, I understand the business behind it. But I think over the years, they found a better way of doing that by, like, introducing, like, spinoff shows like Beast Wars or things like that. So you could sell very different new toys and stuff without having to kill, like, the most iconic character in the film. <laughs> so because I saw that as a kid and I remember, like, you know, it was like a brave thing from a studio standpoint. But at the same time, it's like, it was undone in the series later, obviously, because duh. And it just like I wanted to be in. I wanted to see a movie where I could like see Optimus Prime on the big screen as a kid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yep. I don't. That is by far like 
on my list of worst movies just because I still think that that was like an insanely weird thing to do to kids. But obviously, an '80s movie, and you know, they did terrible things to us in the '80s. And but well, it had a real effect on other param or not Paramount. Uh, I don't even know who owned the brand at the time, but the GI Joe yeah. film was originally yeah. intended to kill off Duke. And yep. then because of the reception, they brought Duke yep. back at the end being like, I'm okay. Like in a stretcher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it's like, like I get it, but I don't think people like, I don't, I mean, I don't think they realize like how much people actually like love that. And I mean, it's, it's a testament to the fact of like how in, like enduring that character is that every single one of these other movies with the exception of like, you know, the first like Bumblebee and the first, transformers movie like are all very optimist centric right like Mm -hmm. he is the coolest character like you could call the show optimus prime yeah nobody would actually bat an eye that's exactly it so you know whatever i was part of a facebook group that was every i think i said this on the last one every leadership lesson i learned from optimus prime back in like you know when facebook had groups or whatever but um but yeah so i joke a bit there but i also do think it kind of has like there's a lot of great things about it, but I think it was built on a fundamentally like commercial premise. And that was kind of like, you know, I guess maybe a prelude to what was coming (laughs) with these other movies, but um, third worst um, and second worst of the live action movies, the last night, um, which I was actually on set for. And like the things that they told us about what that movie was going to be, seeing the final version of the movie was very, very like off putting and very, very weird. Um, but I mean, that, that one always felt like this weird vestigial organ to me from like age of extinction, which I liked more that it was sort of like, okay, now we have Mark Wahlberg and we're going to like keep this thing going and we're going to blow it up even more. But it's like, by the end of that movie, it's like earth is being torn apart and earth is Unicron or something. And it was like, which is a version from a, from one of the comic or from one of the cartoons. It is true, but it like. The physics at the end of that movie don't even make sense. I mean, it's one of those things like, you know, the uh, like the Eternals, like the big thing coming out of the ocean. It's like it doesn't like this does not make any sense. Like I can suspend a certain amount of disbelief, especially in Transformers movies. But even I was like, what is going on in that movie? The the next worst one so this would be third worst of the live action movies, I think, is Age of Extinction, which I is like kind of a bummer because I was super jazzed about the Dinobot. And I actually really liked in that movie the Optimus Prime storyline. Like, I still really like the idea of like, okay, let's kind of do the Bumblebee thing, but this time it's Optimus Prime, and he's like so damaged that like Mark Wahlberg has to like fix him, and he's in the like G one truck version and stuff. Like, I thought all that was very very cool. Um, but that's also the one that introduces like, is it that one that introduces, or is it the last night that introduces? I think it's that one, right? That introduces like the floating particle transformers. Yes, because that, it's yeah. like Beats, little My yeah. Little Pony, Galvatron. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. So it's like I can't. I, I think that was Age of Extinction. Yeah, because yes, it is. He's because he's an yeah, inventor. Yeah. If I could take this technology right, right, and put it into right, my yeah. inventions, yeah, yeah, that's it. So like that was ridiculous. Like I get why they did it. It's kind of like T one thousand of Transformers or something. But I mean, it's like. I think it, that's when everything it's really started cheap. off. The... Ben, it's cheap. It's, that's, that's what it. it is. It's cheap. Yeah. It's like, I think what the newer movies, like with Bumblebee and Rise of the Beast, have been really successful at is like kind of bringing it back down to like, I want to see these pieces in these characters like actually move and feel like they're real. And like the Mark Wahlberg movies are where that just completely like before they started doing that, it's like they took it to the other extreme and it didn't feel like this isn't Transformers. This is like, liquid robot people and that's not as interesting to me um i was okay with like grimlock i didn't hate grimlock as much as everybody did like you well, know they I advertised really... dinobots and then they're in the movie for the last that's that it that, was, that the biggest... was excruciating long or excruciating yeah, like problem with that one for sure was like yeah and i mean they had no personalities and stuff either which the original ones at least like were sort of disgruntled like you know crazy people they were so, stupid yeah. Yes, that's the, right. That was they were nice dumb. Plan. Me, Grimlock. Yeah. yeah uh-huh. so, dumb. so before Age of Extinction, I put Rise of the Beast. I know some people really, 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 really love that one, um, especially Beast Wars fans and stuff. And I think it did it did deliver on a lot of that. It's also like a good 
Optimus story, it has like very diverse cast. And I feel like they leaned into that really well in terms of like all the other movies, you know, with the exception of Bumblebee were like white savior dudes who had hot girlfriends or daughters and stuff like white daughters. So it it was nice to see them kind of like, be like, this is a world that's like for everybody and be able to like kind of start thinking about what would like almost like a hip hop ish kind of Transformers movie be like and sort of succeeding with that with that premise but i don't think it's as good as bumblebee and i don't think it is as good as a couple of the bay films for reasons that i will explain shortly i think the next best one is transformers one the film we will be talking about um we'll get into that but the reason that i think it is not as good as some of the live action movies is just like i don't know if the at the end of the day i don't know if this story like fully works for me i think it was fun but like the the Megatron transition is like it feels like one of those things where it's like well we need him to become this thing so he's just gonna become that and like the seeds are there a little bit but I I, I like I enjoyed the experience of the movie and I liked a lot of things about it but it also recycles a trans live action Transformers storyline which we'll talk about later and sort of like it does a lot of really original things it's very very cool so it's up there it's one of the best ones but like I don't put it above some of the live action films because it feels like it kind of on it on the surface is like kind of predictable. And also like, I don't know if it takes as many risks as like it could have for a movie that's about like the beginning of Optimus and Megatron's like friendship and then rivalry and stuff like that. So like it a lot. I think it's a great movie, but There are more memorable movies, in my opinion. So the next one, so this would be the third best of the live action Transformers movies, is Transformers Dark of the Moon. And the reason I put that one up there is because like there are problems with it, like a lot of them, but I felt like that was the closest we got to maybe like a Transformers Cybertronian-ish war movie. Of course, it's on Earth, but it's like Chicago, you know, with Shockwave and like the burrowing worm thing and like those all felt like an optimist gets you know like wings and is like flying around you know she like that felt like cool transformers action it felt incredibly epic i think i saw it in imax in like 3d and it was like a very immersive very very one of probably the biggest blockbuster experiences i've ever had in i mean even to this day it's like there are big ass movies we've had in the last decade but that one is up there in terms of scale and like cool set pieces and excitement and stuff like that in my opinion it's also one of the ones that like had the least like just like weird like were like cut up and was like really hacked to pieces like the first one you know there's like characters that just disappear from it and that happens in a couple of the other ones because like they just didn't have the money or like the time to like shoot those scenes or whatever and so it's like barricade just disappears from the film right and it's like they had to do a comic that explained like where he was like at the end of that movie and stuff like that and like transformers dark of the moon felt like from the beginning to the end like everything was there it was like it felt like a complete story and it had stakes and like patrick dempsey's weird and you know there's some stuff like that that doesn't quite work but I think like the Transformers action of that is very, very good. And the Sentinel Prime like twist and stuff is good. And the way that like Megatron ends up kind of like being sort of an, like a anti-hero at the end of the movie and stuff like, but it's still evil. As shit. Like all that stuff like ended up really working for me. Um, the next one is Transformers, like the, oh, the seven. first live action yeah. one. Yep. And I I put that one up there just because like when you think back on that, there is some weird stuff like the things I was talking about about Barricade. Megan Fox is bending over cars. Like there's a lot of problems with that movie. But the first time you see one of those Transformers transform on the like army base when they like, you know, forget which I'm spacing. Blackout. Yeah. Like lands and it makes a Transformers noise. And that one actually, like, you do see the parts moving and it feels more, like, grounded than what happens at the end of the movie where it's just, like, a blur of parts or whatever. That was one of the coolest and most exciting things, like, I have ever seen as a movie go and, like, a fan of this kind of stuff. Like, I thought that was, like, 
okay, we're in for something really awesome. And then you had Scorpionok, which was cool. Like when Optimus Prime, like, and the other Autobots come down and like the music is soaring and he transforms in front of me. He's like 30 feet tall or 20 feet tall or whatever. Like that stuff was 22 like, feet tall. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> to be perfectly accurate. Yeah. Well, that's why he's not the classic Peterbilt. Exactly. Right. Yeah. They had to, they added a front so yeah. it could be two feet tall. Yeah, that's it. But like, I mean, that as a Transformers fan, as a kid that grew up with these characters, like hearing Peter Cullen's voice and seeing it coming out of like a living, breathing, you know, Transformer and then seeing like Megatron and how powerful he was at the end and Starscream, like seeing these characters and how they successfully like recreated those dynamics with these live action characters. Like Megatron was like scary at the end of that movie, you know, like. There was it was just like I thought that was all like really successful. Looking back, the human stuff is stupid and a lot of the comedy is very Michael Bayish and goofy and shit. It doesn't make any sense. But like fundamentally the Transformer stuff in that movie is really great and I think like nails the characters at least that they focus on. I mean, like Jazz just gets torn in half and Ratchet is kind of there to be like whatever, but I thought the like Bumblebee Optimus Starscream megatron stuff was really good and then like black eye was just dope so so number one though is bumblebee and like bumblebee is up there because i think bumblebee is a better version of the first transformers movie in every way except for the fact it doesn't have like optimus and some of the like other characters like as part of the present day past until kind of the end but i mean the the cybertron stuff is also just like straight out of like my child brain of what these like animated characters would look like in live action so that's my ranking some controversial some controversial bits there but but like bumblebee is like what transformers one should have been like much better female like a female lead much better actress than shia labeouf like doing shia labeouf stuff like i i thought it was like that was an amazing reset on the franchise and you can see why they've carried through with that instead of carrying through with like whatever happened in the last night and stuff like that. Yeah, I uh I don't think we differ too dissimilarly. I stand on so starting with mine, 7 is the last night yes. for its incoherentness and runtime. That movie is 3 hours long. Very long. Absolutely ridiculous. Uh Revenge of the Fallen for all of your notes. Yep. Age of Extinction is a mess. And again, a lot of the things are similar. Yep. Dark of the Moon to me is number 4 struggles because it continues the problems that age or oh my goodness revenge of the fallen had right it's simpler i did not remember till you said it that leonard nimoy was sentinel prime i completely forgot that's who that was so for me it's just it's more coherent than the three previous in in, um, installments that i mentioned rise of the beasts is number three i didn't include transformers one on this for its portrayal of the Beast Wars characters, being a 90s kid myself, yep. I thought that was really cool. Yep. But it has issues, and we discussed this, if everyone wants to hear our full review, it came out yep. whenever it did, uh, in terms of wait, too many plot lines, and then the, yep. the adventure of it was not necessarily enjoyable, but I liked a lot of the yeah. same, same things you did. Bumblebee is only number two on my list because I love Haley Steinfeld. Yep. But for whatever reason, I found the character so unlikable. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. It was, I didn't see, I think we discussed this on Rise of the Beast. I didn't see it in theaters. Oh. I was done with Transformers at that point. Yep. And watched it whenever it hit Prime. And I just found her really annoying. I guess I can, I mean, I can see that. Which is unfortunate because a lot of the movie is great. You're, the best Transformers movie is the 15 minutes on Cybertron. Yes. Like that, you could have released that and it would have. Yeah probably made half a billion dollars yeah and transformers one is number one for all of the reasons you listed and the word that i will always hold on to was grounded was a great description but for me it was more than anything and it's something we've lost in a lot of these big franchises i saw a tweet the other day that we haven't seen bruce banner turn into the hulk since avengers one yeah and for transformers 2007 the tangibility of those transformations Yep. allowed it to feel so real yep. where we weren't hiding things behind behind walls or characters weren't just appearing yep. as a robot or a car. These things existed. 
But I think this is the perfect segue into our Transformers 1 review with no spoilers, Mm -hmm. which is moving into Transformers 1. So, how long do you think we'll be here? I'm not talking to you. You know what? We are so screwed. Thought you weren't talking to me. You two, come with me. I am so tired of seeing Optimus Prime with lips. (laughs) It drives me insane. And the Transformers films have permeated this problem and made it a regular part of his character. I have watched every Transformers series that has ever aired on this side of the planet. I've not watched the anime. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And ever since 2007, Transformers has lips. We are not in spoilers. Orion Pax is in, the, is in this film. We yep. won't get into plot specific details. Orion Pax did have lips. And that's okay with me. But in the final trailer, they show you Optimus Prime with the faceplate, but they're lying to you. There are lips behind there. <laughs> it's all right. That was my rant, and it's been bothering me since Saturday. The, like the, I also like wondered a little bit with this film, and maybe it's like when you see the lip on Orion Pax or somebody in like a comic book or something. It's like it's one thing, but when you when you see it in this movie. I don't understand the physics of the lip on the robots because it's the only organic part of them. Like the or organic meaning can't see like any kind of mechanical thing happening. It's just like No, they look like the silver surfer. Yeah, that's it. Like that they're liquid, right? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's, it's their eyes there's like a whole subplot of like like Megatron's eyes in this movie of like watching like how they yep. you know like go from being these sort of bright optimistic you know like w- yellow eyes to becoming this like you know dark red intense eye he gets Sith <laughs> eyes yeah exactly and it's like like they even though they're changing color like you can see the little like throughout the thing you can actually see these little like kind of gears like sort of turning in their eyes in every single scene and then you scroll like halfway down their face and it's like liquid metal like just yeah moving <laughs> like it is, all right it is it is weird like it's a kid's movie it's fine but it 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 doesn't you know like again there's plenty of suspension of disbelief these are robots that turn into you know vehicles and stuff like that but it is it felt like that was one of those things where it's like it just didn't look natural <laughs> to me no I'm going to kind of unload what didn't work about this movie for me because sure. I know obviously based on your minor discussion and ranking how much you liked about it. And I, I left this with a similar feeling to the super Mario bros movie we got last year. Yep. And the sentiment that I had, and I couldn't let it go complete cards on the table. Listeners will know. I reacted quite negatively to the trailers for this. I started doing trailer reactions last year and I still have unanswered questions like why there are insecticons or mammalian based animals on cybertron they shouldn't be there yet but that's neither here nor there or is it at all addressed in the film as the negative comments said which was clearly i didn't understand transformers um but it was the sentiment has been forever growing up with this these franchises for as long as we have it's 40 years people it's been 40 years it's a long time which is we forever have asked for a live action trans or not a live sorry a transform since the original film, which I want to say was 86. I'm probably getting that date. But we have since that film, we have been asking for a Transformers film that is just about Transformers. Similar to Nintendo's fear forever to make another Super Mario movie after 86. After the release of the live action Super Mario Bros. movie. And my feelings were that was okay but i wish it was more and that came down to several things and one of the elements that i hate hearing specifically and we're both on film twitter which is a horrible place to be i would recommend nobody be a part of this yeah it's not like a actual reality it's not how people actually feel about these things (laughs) no not it's not at all and it's the loudest voices is and i'm trying not to be negative i'm trying to just be critical We both have kids. We watch a lot of films that are designed for children. Yep. And 
but I'm not ex- the bars are typically it's a Pixar, it's a a DreamWorks Spider Verse more recently, and a lot of this film to me felt like more common denominator writing. Whether that was the twist, which I predicted about five minutes in, yeah, one hundred percent, particularly, and unfortunately, it just it left. I wanted more from this because clearly the investment is in this as a brand, as a franchise. It's going to sell billions of dollars worth of toys. Yep. But in an animated version of this, and it was my, I'm I'm rambling here. But one of my points for why I thought Across the Spider-Verse was the best movie of 2003 was it had just as good writing as the films everyone was touting from live action. But because of the art form, it could elevate beyond anything possible with live action. 100%. Yeah. And am I expecting this to be that? No. But I have to say it's been nearly 40 years since we've had another animated Transformers film. And for, I a thousand percent agree with your criticism on that was completely a brand shift. Like yep. we're going to, we're going to kill all these characters off so we can sell new toys. There definitely would have been a better way to do that, but I will credit them with at least they did something interesting in giving us a hero's journey. We're both familiar with Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and whatnot yep. with Rodimus prime and hot rod. And that this film suffers so much from telling us and not showing us which is unfortunate where it, the movie is going to work for a lot of people. And I know it's going to be reacted to quite positively, but it was just fine. And those are the worst movies, particularly with these brands that we love so much. Yeah, I think that's true. I don't think like, you know, like I said, I took Flynn to this. I mean, largely based on the fact that at some level I knew it was going to be probably too violent, too violent and like adult for her. <laughs> but I was like, I told Ashley, I was like, I was like, what's PG-13 or it's PG. It's like the same as Frozen and Frozen has some scary parts. I I like went into it kind of being like, this is like a cool, you know, something I loved as a kid. Like, you know, it'd be fun to see if she's like into this kind of thing. And as a kid's movie, colorful, explosive, funny, like a good introduction to characters that I have loved or, you know, like been scared of as a kid or whatever. It does all of that really well. Like, I think by the end of it, you get the Megatron that is, we all know, you know, you have, you know, Optimus Prime in some form that we all know, like, and there's like a future ahead of these characters. Yeah, I mean, there's a future ahead of these characters and you can see the beginning of that, that like these friendships and everything. But I will tell you, it's not as good of a like Cybertron story as the war and fall of Cybertron games are. Those are like, far more in line with like if i was to be like i want to watch a you know cgi like transformers on cybertron thing i would honestly like slapping together all the cgi segments from those two games is like feels like a more ambitious and like interesting concept than what ultimately this was like this was like a live action cartoon at the end of it which i I mean i think is what they were going for which is fine but is it the Cybertron movie that we have all been waiting for is definitely not. I mean, the characters that are in the movie are all the same characters that we have seen in live action. Now they're just like, you know, they're just like kind of animated versions of them and stuff. And like, I I don't know that I loved the character design on a lot of them either. I felt like it's kind of a little bit like go bot ish or something. It's not like the characters don't, I mean, there's sort of like, I guess a Canon reason for it, but it's like they didn't feel as solid. They felt sort of stringy and stuff like that. And like, I like the blockier, more, you know, classic sort of designs of the characters and stuff, which is why like the war for Cybertron, fall of Cybertron games are like really freaking awesome. I rewatched just randomly the trailer recently for fall of Cybertron with like Metroplex and just how like epic that trailer for that game was. And I remember playing that game and like, Metroplex is like walking around in the back, you know, and like interacting with kind of like your character, which is like more in the front. Like he's like throwing stuff and breaking stuff that's like falling in front of you. And like as he's like destroying all these Decepticons and stuff. And it's like that scale is missing from this movie for sure. There's no character that is bigger than like Sentinel, and Sentinel's barely bigger than the main characters. And it's like, 
a lot of Transformers lore, and it's definitely someplace they can go in the future, is like, you know, some of these things are like godlike creatures, you know, that are like in the world or are like, you know, things like combining the combiners or, you know, Insecticons or something becoming something bigger. It's like, it surprised me that they didn't do some of that because like that seems like the reason you haven't been able to do a CGI Cybertron movie is because we'd need a scale to the visuals and stuff that animation makes easier, but then they didn't do a lot in this movie that you couldn't have done in live action in some ways. It's kind of weird in that way, but is it, I mean, it's a great, I mean, people are going to be pissed at us. Because they're going to think we're doing something that's like good, but because it is objectively a good movie. It's safe. That's the problem. It is. It's safe. Yeah, it is safe. That's, that's that's my main issue. It's safe in almost every way. Yeah, yeah. It's. Yeah. I I think there's a lot to like about this. I think Brit talking about Flynn seeing it's a really great point. As a entry point into this franchise, it is going to work really well. But something that I've really struggled with, and it's been one of those pull pull and I don't know, give and take things I've had my wife has had to yep. talk to me about when introducing certain things and like obviously you would like your kids to like the same things as you sometimes they don't sometimes they yep. love Spidey and his amazing friends um yeah but in general what I find to be the best indicator of the quality of a film aimed at kids or in brackets families because typically that's how these things have to work from a financial standpoint yeah which is it's iron the irony is a lot of why disney's films post 2005 started getting rated pg by the mpaa is they found if their films were rated just g they were less likely to get adults without children yeah. so if yeah. we put in a couple of those little bit ruder jokes that push us yeah. into pg we're more likely to get adults in and Having worked at the theaters in college, obviously I see all these big films now. You can tell the quality of a film aimed at children by the si the the silence of the audience during dialogue. Unless it's a joke, yep. obviously then laughter is going to be occurring. But man, I saw this and there were people talking constantly, yeah, yeah. which has been, uh, I would say, a larger problem pandemic onward. But a lot of this feels illumination esque and not in the good ways like yeah. i think brian tyree henry does a good job i mean i've always been a big fan of the star scream you him like yeah, everyone yeah. loves frank welker and the yeah, yeah. the sounds of their voice and peter cullen's booming i mean those defining character voices are why these characters are as iconic as they are yeah i like what they're given to do in this but that relationship and that dynamic is talked about and then the resolution on the quote unquote origin that is on all the posters. I don't know if it's on the one I have. Yeah, it is. It says witness the origin just behind my head. Okay. <laughs> and it is like an e-break turn to I'm bad now. Yeah. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And where if you took the time, kids will sit through a compelling story. I took both my kids to see Inside Out 2. And what I loved so much about what they took from it, Sawyer's four when we saw this, Yep. And I asked him point blank. And again, not everybody's going to be Pixar, but my biggest concern was, and I asked him, I said, Sawyer, did you think anxiety was the bad guy? No, anxiety just wanted Riley to be happy. Like, mm. boom. Yeah. Got it. Concept yeah. Except that is so important that the film manages to deliver where yeah. I think a lot of people, particularly now, like the nuclear family does not exist anymore. There's so many... I would say there's probably more blended families than there are nuclear. At least yeah. It was projected in the yep. 50s and then my rant will be over. And to have this dynamic where you're going to introduce these characters who do have a relationship depending on the canon version you want to go with, that could have been really interesting. And kids have seen sad things happen in movies and they're big robots, like two people yep. who have chosen to be a family. And it's a dynamic that's not really changed. I, I mean, I feel like spoilers are probably the best way to explain why I don't think this works, but I think yeah. Keegan Michael Key is there to be Keegan Michael Key. Yep. And Bumblebee is, in my opinion, shouldn't be annoying. And I found him to be that way. Scarlett Johansson is Alita One. Why isn't she RC? That bothered me so much. 
much. Like, yeah, you know what? It's like there's two. You're kind of hitting at two things too that like I thought were problems as like a parent taking my kid to this. Where I thought like also the movie is lazy in some of its humor or like it kind of just like it's like lowest common denominator is like Alita One is actually kind of mean in the movie and not in like a way that's like yeah initially it's because she sort of gets screwed over in a way that she can be angry about but it's like she tells someone she tells another robot to like shut the hell up and then she tells other people to shut up and it's kind of like i get that i get my kid was younger than you're supposed to be to take a kid to this movie but even like an eight-year-old seeing that like seeing like a heroic character like being just sort of like shut up you shut up or whatever it's sort of like i don't know wasn't there like a more nuanced way of making that character tough but not just sort of like dismissive or mean and the other thing was like it leans heavily on this like this bumblebee joke where he like does like he says bad acetron he calls him he's like kind of trying to come up with a name for himself he calls himself bad acetron and they do it in like the frank welker voice or whatever of of sound waves yeah. voice or whatever and it's like you do that over and over and over and over again and it's like Again, my kid's younger, so badass was probably not something I wanted her to hear. But it's like, also, that joke isn't really that funny. Like, it, and they go back to that well like a bunch of times. And I think your, I think your assessment that it's quite like illumination, but not in the good way, is a very good way of putting it. Like, this is not, this is not a, you know, how to train your dragon one. It's not a like, you know. 2010s era Pixar movie it's like it's much more like CGI was the best way of being able to like throw together a Transformers movie on Cybertron aiming it at a different audience that cannot is too young to go to these like live action movies and it's a it's a fun movie it's it's very fun but it's like none of this stuff it's not the most interesting animation we've seen the last few years like I think you're right that Spider-Verse like really created like a new bar there and i would say even like tmnt like you know like that movie has problems but like i actually think that was more of like a risky in terms of both animation and in terms of what they do in that film than this this is like very much a, a cgi version of a cartoon which is again i mean going to be very successful and is a good movie but as like a transformers fan wanting like a really epic you know, like Cybertron movie. This is not it. This is not a comic book story type Transformers movie. It is very much like something you would have seen on, you know, Fox, like on Saturday morning. You know, if if like they like more reboot than, you know, something than it is like this or whatever. Yeah, I think that's a great place to pivot, which is so let's we're going to go into spoilers. We'll get let's I'm not going to we're going to jump into spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie yet and you don't want it spoiled don't worry we'll jump into the outro included in the outro if you're listening to this right now will be my initial reactions to agatha all along and penguin so if you're curious that will be included in the outro of this but we're going to jump in. Okay, i'm curious to hear. i'm curious to hear that too <laughs> we'll uh we will uh jump into spoilers right now look that's starscream and your shockwave and sound wave enough gosh raise your hand if wave is in your name there's a lot of wave you're uh, one of the aspects for me, and I think you really touched on this, which is a benefit. And I want to just, just be, I, I try to be the most optimistic. I know Jermaine loves that from me, but maybe it's my Canadian nature yep. is that finally, and this is, I give the movie a lot of credit. The pathos of the Transformers universe was treated with respect in terms of yep. Primus and you referenced planet size Transformers. But I have to say, so we're in full spoilers and I laughed out loud when we got the hall of primes like because it's not a new thing it literally happened in revenge of the fallen where it's like somebody is going to be opt autobot jesus this time of course it's going to be orion pax and it was again all these characters we've seen one element to me that would have improved this dramatically which would have been i like the concept of the conspiracy happening with sentinel prime him having made yep. a deal with the Quintessons, which on paper, I love that. Yep. But it seems like four people are in on this. Like to make this work, 
Yeah. Where and they have their cogs. So we've got a new part of them that I was unaware of prior are the reason they can't transform. Yeah. All transformers are supposed to be built with cogs, but it's a class system, which again, yeah. on paper, I love all of these choices. Yeah, and some of that's in the comics, the like the pass system thing is is definitely in cer- certain cases there. Yeah. But then Sentinel Prime is immediately introduced. I'm like, something's a f- I don't like this guy. Something is up. Maybe because it's Corey Stoll. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And um, the relationship between Optimus and Megatron or DB, whatever his name is. I don't know. DB 108. DB. Yeah. I have the plot here. What is his name? Uh, did D16. And I ac- again. Wait, you said that you said someone who was Corey Stahl? Uh, no, I got his. Who? It's somebody else. Who was that? It was John Hamm. John. Sorry, Hamm. John Hamm. And it's like the second you put the, you put the fact that John Hamm is voicing him, you know he's going to be like, I mean, I'm trying not to cut, but a douchebag, right? You're going to have to like, it's yeah. like. Well, he's introduced that way. Yes. He's shown, he's shown in this way and they're like, everyone's fawning over him. Yeah. But then it's like, he gives this like, I don't actually, like laissez-faire, I don't care about these yeah. people stuff. And it's yeah. like, okay. And we're all subternal. What's going on here? And then Lawrence Fishburne shows up for the cave of exposition yep. where we learn everything that's happening. Like, yeah, you would know this as an actual writer. And it was a, it was a trend for a while where films either had crawls or beginnings. Yeah. And I actually think this movie would have done really well yes. to open up with the battle against the Quintessons, like really show yeah. us what was going on. And then, yeah. but if they'd show, and uh, it's not how it's probably just would have been as opposed to, halfway through the movie, if it gives us Sentinel's perspective, yeah, where Cybertron is now, yeah. and we get like the heroic Sentinel Prime, but also the relationship with these quote unquote brothers is just like, you're my brother. And Orion really seems to be holding up this side of the relationship, trying to do things for DB16 while also being selfish. And jumping back to what you said about Alita 1, I could understand if Orion is doing anything malicious or has some sort of negative intent. Yep. But as he is the hero of our story, he does it. Like he saves Jazz's life. That's why she gets fired. Okay, but he saves somebody's life. Like he wasn't like, I need to get more Energon, so I'm higher on yeah. the minor list. So she comes off as mean and unlikable, and she's supposed to be one of our heroes. Yeah, I found that to be like I found that to be like weirdly problematic because it was sort of just like, this is how you're gonna portray like, I mean, she has some soft moments with him and stuff. And like, you know, this whole thing about like how she's better at everything except one thing. And it's that he is like optimistic and has hope and stuff like that. I mean, she has like good moments, but it's also just like. I found that to be really just like weird. to Take like a heroic female Autobot. And kind of just make her like sort of it's it's kind of like what what someone thinks a tough person is but that's not actually how tough people are you know it's one of those things where it's like oh tough people tell people to shut up and they don't take anybody's crap or something but it's like that's not really what it means to be like like tough you know like being tough means being like firm with people or you know telling people things that they don't want to hear or something but it's not like like she should have lifted, she lifts him up for the one scene, but that relationship doesn't feel earned because she's just been belittling him for an hour and a half. Yeah, the entire- right? Yeah. We're introduced to the room of cameos, which quite literally, if you're listening to this, will be the sound clip of pointing everybody out. And to me, that was just another example of it's like somebody said this in a writer's room. It's like, oh, it's funny. How all the Transformers have wave names. Yeah, it's a funny observation. It's not a good joke. Like it's just. These things were all named in the 80s. There were, it was like you ended in Ur or Wave. Yeah. <laughs> like this is what we did for Transformers. And then because we need, we need, and it's like checking boxes off a list. Yeah. We need the Decepticons. Yeah. We need Starscream. We need Soundwave. We need, oh my, Shockwave. I almost forgot his name. But then you, again, yeah. even coming from the toy perspective, which is the most cynical part of me in this. Yep. Where's Sound? Where's. Where's um oh my gosh um who's the panther cassette tape ravage right like in soundwave ravage like where's ravage where's frenzy 
Yeah, it's weird because like, yeah, I mean, Soundwave, it's like seemed like the perfect opera. I mean, even in the live action Bumblebee part on Cybertron, yeah. it's like we see him eject tapes out of himself and like, you know, but you don't get rubble, you don't or rumble, you don't get, yeah, laser beak. You don't get any of those characters in this, even though you have Soundwave. For sure. I thought that was, it was also just weird that they kind of were like, oh, there's this band of outcasts led by Starscream and like, you know, I don't know. I mean, that, you know, it's fine. Again, like you said, it's like you need to get those guys in the movie. So that's where they are. But and, you know, this is going to be the future Decepticon group that Megatron, you know, kind of co op at the end of the movie or something. But it's again, like once you get to the point where Megatron starts being evil and they've got their cogs and like, you know, that transition starts to happen, he starts standing up to Starscream. And these guys become his. It's like we're just on a roller coaster of trying to like align all of the unique pieces they've set up and smash them into the track that they need to be on, which is okay, like this is how he's going to get on top of Starscream and Soundwave and Shockwave were already there. And like this is how he's going to form the Decepticon army. Well, it already kind of was an army. And like it just sort of locked into like, okay, this is like there's track that's laid at the beginning that's unique and then the last like 30 minutes is like well this is like all the fan fiction anybody would have ever written about how megatron became who he is and how he got like the decepticon army to you know together or whatever and then he we're gonna kill optimus prime and bring him back in the same 15 minutes (laughs) in a matter of yeah in the same breath yeah i mean it kind of worked for me because it's like all about like primus like you know wasn't going to give sentinel the matrix of leadership because he was a, you know he was a piece of crap but he like you know optimus does a self-sacrificing thing for the sake of 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 cybertron and so he's rewarded for that or whatever but but the thing that i would like was alluding to from ripping off a, a dark of the moon storyline or a previous live action storyline is the evil sentinel thing like that's not really a thing in the comics or previous animated series like he is in most of those versions, like Optimus's mentor and is killed in selfless ways or, you know, like sacrifices himself or whatever else. Like he is genuinely, generally a good character. Like that's not a thing that happens often. I think there's some allusions in the comics to like him being like, you know, kind of like more of a politician or something than you know, someone like Optimus, who is just like, I mean, not naive, but he's just like so black and white in terms of like he is, you know, like as pure hearted as possible that there were like things that Sentinel had done that were maybe a little bit more in the gray. But this idea that, you know, Sentinel betrays his own people in an effort to amass power or you know, save Cybertron. In both cases, he's saving Cybertron in his mind, but he's also like benefiting from, you know, being the person who betrays like his friends and stuff. I thought that was just like really weird because that was like, there's so many Transformers you could call on to run that plot. Nemesis Prime. Exactly. Like there's a zillion different things you could do here. And it's like, you choose the same thing as was what was legitimately one of the better twists in like the live action series and stuff. And you do it worse. Like John Hamm is just kind of like a, you know, he's just like goofy kind of. and stuff. He's sleazeball. Yeah. He's a sleazeball. And it's like, it's so obvious out the gate that this is where things are headed and it's not played that way. And I get, again, I get it's a kid's movie. Like kids probably aren't picking up on that necessarily, but like, it's still weird because it's something that's been done better before in the live action movies. And it's hard to point to things that the live action movies do better, you know, than like what this movie was capable of doing in some cases, especially, you know, once you get past Transformers one and you're in Transformers two, three, four, five territory. Yeah. I think the the film's lack of spectacle was kind of disappointing. As you put the, they didn't, the limits, Obviously, these are poor people. Like, hopefully, they weren't crunched at all. That hasn't been reported yet. Yeah. But, or hope, fingers crossed, it isn't. Yeah. But everything sticks to the mechanical and in a way that probably it should. But I, yeah, I'm, 
I think a lot of people are going to like this and I'm totally okay with that. But having waited for something that was truly going to dive into the quite expansive lore and doing yep. stuff we've seen before. Heck, it could have been Ultra Magnus. Like he's never getting any play in anything anymore. That's it. Yeah, that's it. It's unfortunate. I'm I am curious to see what we do moving forward as the film does end kind of setting up the Autobot Decepticons. Yep. A conflict which is eternally the issue or the con the major conflict of that entire franchise. Yeah, and Cybertron is fine at the end of it, right? Like I mean that's that's one of the things that I noticed. It's like I was kind of thinking that Optimus would get the matrix of leadership, give everybody their cog, but the energon would not be flowing again. And so it's like they're really putting their finger on the scales that the like the actual conflict between Megatron and Optimus is what will eventually make Cybertron. And I know that's in the lore that it's like that war is what drains Cybertron of its energon and you know they have to go to other worlds and stuff like that, but but it's like it's hard for me to understand at the end of this movie, like how that war happens. Kind of like it feels like if at the end of this movie, because they're divided or something, or maybe something Megatron had done, even though everybody gets their cogs and like Optimus becomes Optimus Prime or whatever, like there's still damage to the planet or something that then forces them in a second movie to like be even more in conflict because there's scarcity or there's, you know, some thing that needs to be accomplished in order to get the energy on flowing again. And they have different ideas of how to accomplish that. That, but that doesn't feel like, I mean, right now it's like Megatron, Megatron, it puts, it puts its finger on the scale of Megatron is going to be the one that's going to like mess everything up because he's going to like come back and create this war. And that's, what's going to drain Cybertron of its, of its energy on. But that's, like generally it's more been about Cybertron doesn't have Energon and these two factions like have different ways of trying to address that problem and they go to war over it and that makes things even worse. So, like it's weird that at the end of it, it's like everything's fine except for the fact Megatron has an army now and for some reason is going to be willing to like actually like make things worse for everybody even though he's still operating out of the mindset that he's doing it for the right reasons, which I think he believes. Like, I don't think Megatron is necessarily like obsessed with power. I think he thinks that like the only way to do it is to like, you know, become the most powerful stuff like that, but he's doing it in a, for a selfless reason. I mean, that's always been what's interesting about that character. And like, this puts the finger on the scale of more like, he's going to be the one that's going to mess it up. And that's a bit of a departure that I think may be a self-inflicted wound that didn't need to happen because you could have written something into this movie that would have already created that, set up that conflict and the need for that conflict. And so, yeah, I mean, you and I have been like negative. It's one of those things that like we used to do this on the Screen Rant podcast and we do it on Podcast X where it's just like, you can really like something and have enjoyed it. But also, I think when you said it's fine, it's just fine. It's like, those are the movies where it's always the easiest and most interesting to unpack all the things that kind of went wrong because it's not a bad movie because then you're just making fun of the movie or something. But this is one of these things where like you're looking at it and you're like, there's so much good stuff here and there's so much like goodwill towards wanting this to be good. Like, why couldn't it have been 15% better and then been awesome? Yep, I agree. And instead it's just like, yeah, it's going to make a lot of money. A lot of kids are going to see it. They're going to get excited about Transformers. That's all great. But it kind of is like a lazy. Halfway through, it becomes something very rote. That's not nearly as interesting as what it was setting up. Somewhere. Yeah. All right. So that will do it for our spoilers review for Transformers <laughs> one. If you've got kids and you want to sell toys, you make an 80s movie, a cartoon. Um, yeah, that's it. that that does it for that. Jumping into the outro. All right, as mentioned, I'm going to give my brief impressions of Agatha All Along and The Penguin. Let's talk about Agatha All Along at first, which is, it's interesting that this is coming out when it is. Three years after the success of WandaVision, Marvel's in a substantially different place than they were when that premiered. I think there was a lot of optimism behind Marvel TV, specifically on Disney+. Plus. We were just sort of out of the endgame era. and. I think the show is okay. 
What's disappointing to me is from Marvel's television banner, we've gotten a wide variety of television shows, special presentations. What I was really hoping that Agatha all along would be more similar to is something like the Marvel special presentation Werewolf by Night, which really did lean more into the horror elements and specifically that of the schlocky B movies, where Agatha all along just feels like cable TV on a streamer. This is something that Rob, friend of the show, has mentioned where they don't feel like premier television, specifically because the expectations for Marvel, I think, have really lowered over time, unfortunately, with a quantity of projects not all aiming and hitting the same thing. I had friends and family asking me what I thought about this, and unfortunately, my biggest issue is why I feel Phase 3 and Phase 2 were more successful was each product, not product, again, I, I don't like using those words, but each project had a specific tonal shift from the others, where Agatha all along could have really felt more spooky. And honestly, it would have been really cool if it was more akin to the chilling adventures of Sabrina that was on Netflix most recently. The show feels budget, which is unfortunate. Catherine Hahn as this character could be really interesting. I hope Agatha's journey in this specifically with exploring more of the supernatural elements of the Marvel Universe matter that's been another big issue which is even being a fan of some of what we've got from four and five the connective tissue seems to be minimal at best there is a mystery set up in this with who is being played by john locke as the teen there was a lot of expectation behind this it's something that worked out well and not so well for wandavision with the speculation mephisto and all that stuff and whatnot but i hope by the end of this, we're not looking back at Agatha as essentially repeat or Rita Repulsa from Power Rangers, which is how she kind of felt by the end of that show. The momentum was great in the beginning of WandaVision, but ultimately it kind of tailed off like a lot of these Marvel television projects have done on Disney+. Plus. Am I going to keep watching it? Absolutely. But unfortunately, my expectations weren't necessarily high going into it. I'd love nothing more than to be surprised by an interesting story. The idea of almost these misfit witches going down the witch's road could be really compelling if the storytelling is up to the par or bar that we expect from Marvel. I'm really hoping in the next phase of this phase five leading up to the remaining era of this multiverse saga that we start to get a lot more of these projects feeling streamlined into telling a cohesive story because this being the remnants of something that was successful a while ago is even more frustrating when we've had other projects that people really want more from. Specifically, I'm talking about Shang-Chi. I would love to see a Shang-Chi too. It's been three years since that came out and it probably won't come out until the end of the multiverse saga, which is especially disappointing because more than anything, it would have been awesome for some of these new characters in the phases of four and five to be mo moving forward, but they haven't. And there's been a lot of reactionary projects from Marvel, Agatha all along being one of them. So I wasn't blown away. I don't think it's bad. It falls under that banner of like, yeah, it's okay, but I'm not necessarily compelled with what the mystery might be. I really hope it improves. The setup is all right, but it didn't blow my socks off. Switching to The Penguin, however, which is an HBO show made in the universe of the Batman, which is something I've wanted forever. When the DC brand was fledgling under multiple different creative visions prior to James Gunn taking over, I always pitched this idea that the Batman, not the Batman, this new franchise, but the character in general, could support his own universe with how expansive it is with characters and other heroes being Nightwing, Batgirl, Birds of Prey, and whatnot. And they tried to do that to some, to some in some regard. Now we are actually getting this, produced by Matt Reeves, and we are getting a show focusing on Oz Cobb, this version of the Penguin. He's not a Cobblepot, he's just a Cobb. 
Colin Farrell is absolutely spectacular as this character. This show has the bones of what you loved from the Batman while obviously pushing the level of maturity because it's an HBO show. The violence is more gruesome. The language is allowed to be more mature. And because of that, it really does feel like you are getting a new perspective on the crime scene in this version of Gotham City. The power vacuum, the dynamics have changed with the death of Carmine Carmine Falcone. And because of that, a lot of things are on the table, specifically Oz thinking this is his opportunity to become a criminal mastermind, overlord, crime boss, whatever you want to uh, call him. I enjoyed the episode a lot. It's just over an hour long and really does establish all the new interesting relationships we're going to be getting. Kristen Melyotti as Sophia Falcone is terrifying and she delivers such powerful monologues and every time she's on screen, it puts you on edge. And this is a testament to the writing of the show. The Penguin is a bad guy. He's a criminal. He's an antagonist. The way that this show is written He is our protagonist with following this narrative. You want him to succeed. And anytime Oz is with Sophia, he feels at odds, uncertain of what's going to be going on with her. She's a wild card. And I really appreciate that they brought in somebody so talented like Kristen Milioti to really nail the uncomfortability and the unknown of what could be happening, specifically with a character like this with Sophia, who is coming from Arkham Asylum. She had been there for something. We're not necessarily told why, but she is vicious and vindictive and clearly doesn't want to be wronged. This world that as was established in the Batman continuing to be added to, we finally see Salvatore Moroni, played by Clancy Brown, who is in the clink. Watch the Batman for all of that information. And I'm really curious to see how this Sopranos level style show is going to work within the Batman universe. It is a gripping tale of this mob war that's likely going to be happening. People jockeying for position. And that's not to diminish the Penguin at all. If you're going to be inspired by anything when creating a show about the underworld of Gotham, why not look at something like The Sopranos? We even see the Penguin's mom. And that dynamic is really interesting. Something that's come out of the more recent elements of the comics. But From all aspects of this creative process, the writing, the score, the performances, the direction, everything feels premium and as if it is a it is a continuation of the Batman world, which I really appreciate. I'm so glad this show exists, given the fact that the Batman part two is probably not going to come out until 2026, which is especially disappointing, given the how much I loved that first one. but. This is a perfect caveat to waiting for another part of this story. The Batman epic crime saga, this being another installment in it. It's really exciting. It's really worth your time. I highly recommend you check out The Penguin. Now, let's move into question of the week responses. So the question of the week this week was, if you could set a Terminator series in any time and place, what would it be? Dylan Pollock of Movies to Watch Before You Die wrote in, Medieval Terminator wielding a mace against knights sounds cool, or feudal Terminator against samurai. So that being in Japan, that would be really cool. Scotty Cameron wrote in, honestly, Renaissance era Rome would probably be a very interesting place to set a Terminator film or show. The very first guns were built in the same time frame, and it would be cool to see a Terminator use the weapons available from that historical setting. The Assassin's Creed Ezio trilogy actually prompted me to choose that over my go-to, which is World War II era, because I've always been a sucker for World War II anything. And then Ben Kendrick wrote in, Ben, what are you doing? This is amazing. Uh, When dinosaurs were around, actually, no, a better idea would be a 1950s noir crime story. That would be really cool. And then last, we have Keen Machine, Victoria, London, because I love Victoria, London. I think that's awesome. I really enjoyed those. Thank you to everybody who submitted for question of the week. And because I did this with Ben this week, if you have seen all of the, I almost said Terminator. No, not Terminator. If you have seen all of the Transformers films, or even not, if you've, of all the Transformers films, I want to get people's rankings. 
So ranking the seven live action films, I'm going to post Ben and Mines as just pictures later on this week. But I'm really curious. You can comment below on those or you can email and you know how to answer if you are a long time question of the week responder. Thank you so much for listening to the Film Realist podcast. If you would like to get into contact, all of the info is connected in a link tree and the email is there as well. If you'd like to answer question of the week, you can respond to that social media post, which usually goes up on Thursdays or Fridays. Depends when I remember to do it. You can also email the podcast filmrealistpod at gmail.com. Don't forget to leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts or follow the show on any of the podcast platforms. If you are listening on Google Podcasts, we're going away. I don't know why it's going to become something else. So the podcast will be available in all the different places. Ben, I need you on the show at some point to talk about Doctor Who when it eventually comes back. Yeah, we can do that. You were trying to get me. Yeah, you were trying to get me on last year. It was kind of. Yeah, I don't remember why I was. I think I was just like super busy during that time. And I also like I was not I had screeners of those, but I was watching them in real time. So it was like. I just wasn't as up on it as I usually am. I think I was like actually getting to it a couple of days late, which is crazy because like Chudy, like I've interviewed Chudy and also just like I'm a huge fan of sex education, that show. And he's so good in that. And so like for all intents and purposes, like these seasons of this most recent season of Doctor Who is like one of probably the ones I've enjoyed the most in a while. So yeah, I would love to come on. Now that they've kind of, I think, found their stride a little bit too, like it'll be fun to see what they do in season two of that. But uh, next week's episode of the podcast is going to be a jam packed episode. It will be a review of The Wild Robot, which my kids in particular are really looking forward to. And I have a special screening to Super slash The Man, the Christopher Reeve story. Oh man, I want to see it. Yeah, I want to see this. I think I missed my screening of this, but I mean, that looks amazing. I cried during my trailer reaction. So if you want to check that out, it's on all the social media platforms. Uh, my name is Colin Naranya. Thank you so much for listening to the show and I will see you next time.